Governor Murphy, when you're ready. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm joined by the woman who needs no introduction, the commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Person Kelly. Uh, another guy who needs no introduction, the superintendent of the state police, Colonel Pat Callahan. Another familiar face, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Great to have you all there. Uh, Chief Counsel Paramount Barg, and many others on with us. Uh, let's jump right in. Thank you all for your patience to do this uh, this particular session virtually. There is the potential for some heavy storms across central and north Jersey later today and into tonight. Pat will get into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, these storms could bring some high winds and some heavy downpours. While at this time, and we'll obviously update you if this changes, uh, at this time there's no there are no flood watches set. We know things could change quickly and localized flooding is always possible. Please, please, please take every precaution this evening. It looks like another opportunity to stay in and stay safe. I'm not sure where you were, folks, but on Monday night at home, uh, it sounded like a freight train uh, coming at our house, and out of nowhere, the winds spiked dramatically, and it lasted for a very short amount of time, but knocked out a lot of power, uh, particularly the JCPNL uh, area of service. It had to We'll give a little bit of color on that. Moving on, I will start by saying that we do not have any updates for you on booster shots, as the federal government has yet to give us any clear guidance. I would just reiterate, however, that between Judy's team at the Department of Health and Pat's team at the Office of Emergency Management, we continue to pound away at planning for whatever the FDA and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices sends our way. But we do have final guidance. We will get that to you with all the vital information that you need. At this time, though, we are waiting word uh, just as many of you are. I was on the White House uh, yesterday, uh, and they are still in the process of making that determination. Now, regardless of the time frame that the federal government puts forward for boosters, whether it be six months after receiving a second dose or eight months or some other uh, parameter, if you have yet to receive your first dose, now is the time to do it. Once the booster plan is released by the federal government, we do anticipate demand for shots to increase greatly. And I would expect, particularly if they go for the more aggressive six months after your last vaccination plan, uh, we will have a supply demand challenge, at least for some number of weeks. So folks, if you've not gotten your first one, do not put off getting that first shot if you've been waiting to get it. Speaking of which, as of this morning, this is the total number of folks who live, work, or study in New Jersey who have now completed their vaccination courses. There are another, by the way, 758,000 individuals who have received a first dose and are on schedule for their second. As of today, roughly 82% of all eligible New Jerseyans ages 12 years and older have received at least their first dose. This is among the highest rates in the nation, and among that, top tier, we are the largest state. We should all take great pride in being a leader and model state across the entire country. Certainly, the number of those who haven't yet gotten a first dose continues to decrease, but we don't want anyone to be lost once that window for boosters is open. So again, if you've not yet gotten your first dose, go do it today so you can be in the queue for the second dose before what we will expect to be, as I mentioned, a significant increase in demand. Now let's move on to the rest of the day's numbers. Here are today's new case numbers. Now, even though the rate of transmission has lowered and is now hovering just around one, meaning, by the way, let's review that, that each new case is leading to about one other new case. Look at the overall number of positive new cases today. Even at an RT of just a hair about one, that means 2,000 plus new cases a day. We have to keep working to push this down. Vaccination, masking, distancing, all of those remain incredibly crucial. Here are yesterday's hospital numbers. And again, we have begun to see some plateauing of these numbers after a swift run-up. 
but still more than 1,100, as you can see, 1,155 New Jerseyans are in the hospital. Another reason to keep hampering away at this virus. And here are the newly confirmed deaths being reported today. Bless each and every one of them. Now I'd ask you to bear with us as we take a few moments to memorialize several more of those who we have lost to the pandemic. We'll start with this guy, Manalapas Harold Eisen. That's Harold on the right. He was 83 years old. He was a native of Newark, a graduate of Wigwig High School and Seton Hall University. Military service took him and his wife, Peggy, that's Peggy on the left, to Colorado for a time. And his career provided a short detour to Syracuse, New York. But they found their way back to New Jersey in 1974, settling in Manalapan. Harold spent his entire career in sales with the Reynolds Metals Company. But he also loved community theater and acted in as many roles for which he could audition. He also had success as a commercial actor on television and doing voiceover radio work. Harold, Harold was also the man who got the dog park built in Manalapan's Thompson Grove Park, thanks to an essay contest sponsored by the Bush's Beat Company. And here's the story. In 2006, both he and Peggy escaped a house fire. Why? Because their dog, Lulu, woke them up. His retelling of the story won him and Lulu the contest and Manalapan got a dog park. Not only are we big dog people, but one of our dogs is also named Lulu. Harold passed due to COVID on November 19th, and sadly, Peggy passed away this April from other causes. They left behind their sons, David, with whom I had the great honor of speaking on Monday, and his fiance, Susan, their daughter, Melissa, and son-in-law, Philip, and their two grandchildren, Samantha and Alexander, and numerous nieces and nephews, and dear friends, we thank Harold for his service to our nation and for always being a New Jerseyan. May God bless him and Peggy. Next, we'll stay down by the shore to remember Monica Bowright of Manchester Township. Monica was a native of Vena Gehoda, Germany, who came to the United States with a nursing degree, working as a nanny, a nurse's aide, an elder care specialist, and a reflexologist. Always kind, caring, and upbeat, Monica made sure she always made those in her care feel welcomed and comfortable. She was also a tremendous artist. She painted, she created stained glass pieces, rehabbed furniture, quilted, made custom greeting cards for family and friends. I think it's fair to say that Monica was a Renaissance woman. Monica was predeceased by her three husbands, Jacques with whom she had her daughter, Corinne, Christopher, to whom she was married for 48 years, and Lou, who passed away in January of 2020. We lost Monica, by the way, just one month prior to her 80th birthday. She left behind Corinne, and I had the great honor of speaking with Corinne on Monday, lives in San Diego, and she left behind her grandson, Matthias, and her stepdaughter, Lisa, and step-grandchildren, Evan and Ellie. We are honored that Monica chose to make New Jersey her home. We are proud to have called her one of our own. And may God bless her memory. I'll feed us in. And finally for today, let's honor the life of Tom's River, Stuart Stu Christie, this guy. He passed away on February 9th at the age of 67 years. Stu was a land surveyor and planner a longtime member of the New Jersey Society of Land Surveyors and Planners, who had a notable career with several of the leading land use firms in our state. He even had his own practice for a time. A member of the first graduating class of Tom's River North High School in 1971, he and his high school sweetheart, Kit, eventually married, tallying a half century together. He left Kit behind, and I had the great honor of speaking with her on Monday as well, alongside their two sons, Ryan and Sean, and their families, daughter-in-law Megan and Amanda, or daughters-in-law, I should say, respectively, and his beloved grandsons, Parker and Logan, and his newly born granddaughter, Sophia Grace, who was born just last week on September 7th. God bless her. He's further survived by his sisters, Peggy, Barbara, and Kathy, and brothers Mike, John, Jim, and Bob, 
among numerous nieces and nephews, cousins, and of course, dear friends. May God bless Stu and his family. May he be remembered fondly for his quiet, contemplative nature and his professional integrity. Kit asked me a favor, and I will take her up on that. Uh, Stu died waiting for his vaccine appointment. He stood in line and made his appointment just as we asked millions of folks to do. Um, and, he, and he passed while waiting for that. And Kit wanted me to say as emphatically as I could, there's no excuse. That was, Stu died, when, by the way, we had a huge supply demand imbalance. You had to wait. Today, you can walk into almost 1,500 locations anywhere in our state and get vaccinated. So Kit, who has suffered this awful loss and, and her family, asked me to say emphatically, if you're not yet vaccinated, do it as an honor to a guy like Stu who died waiting for his appointment. Go out there and get vaccinated right now. I might add that Kit works side by side with a, a good friend, the mayor of Tom's River, uh, and a terrific leader, Mo Hill. So God bless them all and please get vaccinated. We remember fondly every member of our New Jersey family we've lost and we keep their surviving families in our thoughts and in our prayers. Let's switch gears for a minute and turn to recognize another of the small businesses who have worked in partnership with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority to remain open to serve their communities. Possum University is the four-year-old Monmouth County-based business run by these two, Jamie on the left, John on the right, Caponetta, both veteran animal rescue and behavioral specialists. Their specialty, by the way, positive reinforcement with pets. Through Possum University, Jamie and John provide one-on-one -on -one training for both four-legged and two-legged students. And away from Paulson University, both Jamie and John are associated with other animal-focused nonprofits, helping shelter animals and providing animal health care services. A lot of families have taken on a new pet during the pandemic, and Paulson University has been there to help those lucky canines especially adapt to their new homes and new humans, and vice versa. I had the opportunity to speak with Jamie and John on Monday. They're doing a great job, and I thank them for all that they're doing. Check them out, possumuniversity.com, possumuniversity.com. Finally, before I turn things over to Judy, I know we've all been through a lot together, whether it is the challenges that the pandemic has thrown our way over the past 18 or 19 months, the challenges that storms like Henri and Ida have thrown our way in the past month, or any other numerous challenges or issues in our lives, we've all been asked to deal with a lot. And at times we have all felt overwhelmed. So there are two things I think we believe you should know. First, importantly, it's okay to not be okay. And second, help is available to anyone who wants it. Whatever you're going through, feeling or thinking, we have trained confidential counselors available to listen and to support you. Any New Jersey resident, can call that number right there, 866-202-HELP or 866-202-4357 or text NJ-HOPE to 51684 for free confidential support from NJ Mental Health Cares, a partnership between the Department of Human Services and the Mental Health Association in New Jersey. This toll-free number is open from eight to eight every single day is staffed by live trained specialists. Again, the number is 866-202-HELP or 4357 or text NJ-HOPE to 51684. And for the deaf and hard of hearing, mental health assistance in American Sign Language is also available through a partnership with Access at St. Joseph's Health in Patterson. You can reach them via video phone. That number is at the bottom of the screen, 973 870-0677. Again, 973-870-0677. And that, as you can see, is from Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And again, support is free. It's confidential and it's provided by live trained specialists. Additionally, September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And our Suicide Prevention Helpline, NJ Hopeline, can be reached 24-7 at 1-855-654-654. 6735. Again, that's 1 855 654 
6735. The Hope Line can connect you to anonymous, confidential support if you or someone you care about has said or done something that suggests that they're contemplating suicide. These resources are available to you, so please reach out to the hotline. We've gotten through so much by leaning on each other. We've got a little ways yet to go, but we will get there. And we'll get there as one New Jersey family. And to everyone in our extraordinary Jewish community preparing for Yom Kippur, I wish you an easy and meaningful fast. Gama Hatima Tova. Gama Hatima Tova. That said, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. As COVID-19 continues to circulate in our state, individuals are unfortunately getting ill enough to seek hospital care. If you have symptoms of COVID-19, please get tested as soon as possible. If you test positive, talk to your healthcare provider or your local hospital about whether you are a candidate for monoclonal antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that individuals' bodies make to fight viruses, such as the virus that causes COVID-19. Antibodies made in a laboratory act a lot like natural antibodies to limit the amount of virus in your body. They are called monoclonal antibodies. The goal of this therapy is to help prevent hospitalizations, reduce viral loads, and lessen symptom severity. Antibody treatment can be used by people with mild to moderate COVID-19 who test positive for SARS-CoV-2, are within 10 days of the start of their symptoms, are age 12 or older and weigh at least 88 pounds, and are at high risk of getting very sick from COVID-19 or of needing to be admitted to a hospital because of COVID-19. COVID-19 is a serious illness. It is vital that residents who have symptoms get tested and talk to your healthcare provider about whether antibody therapy is right for them. This is especially important if you have not been vaccinated because we know severe disease and hospitalization is much greater in the unvaccinated. We continue to encourage all those eligible for COVID-19 vaccines to get vaccinated, not only to reduce your risk of severe disease, but also to protect those with whom they come in contact with. It is also vital to keep up with routine immunizations to protect our health and the health of our communities. As we enter the fall season, now is the time to get your annual flu shot. Annual flu vaccination is recommended for everyone six months and older. Influenza, vi influenza viruses and coronaviruses are different. Getting a flu vaccine will not protect you against COVID-19. However, the vaccine can reduce flu illness, hospitalizations, and can help to conserve potentially scarce healthcare resources during the pandemic. It's likely that flu viruses and the virus that causes COVID-19 will both be spreading this fall and winter, making it more important than ever to get the flu vaccine as well. It is the best way to protect yourselves and others, especially those who are particularly vulnerable to both COVID-19 and influenza, such as older adults and those with chronic health conditions. Flu vaccines and COVID-19 vaccines can be given at the same time. Since May, many people have been getting other vaccines at the same time that they receive their COVID-19 vaccine. September and October are good times to be vaccinated against flu. Flu vaccines are safe and effective and are offered in many locations, including doctor's offices, clinics, health departments, urgent care centers, and your local pharmacy. Low or no cost flu vaccines uh, will be available through your local health department, the federally qualified health centers, and some nonprofit organizations. So moving on to my daily report, as the governor shared, our hospitals reported 1,155 hospitalizations of COVID-19 positive patients and persons under investigation. 
Fortunately, uh, there are no new reports of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. We currently have 133 cumulative cases in our state. None of those children are hospitalized. At the state veterans' homes, there has been no new positive cases among residents. And at the state psychiatric hospitals, there's one new case among a patient at Ancora. The percent positivity as of September 11th uh, for New Jersey is 7.45%. The northern part of the state, 6.42%. The central part of the state, 8.11%. And the southern part of the state, 9.31%. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe and get vaccinated to protect ourselves, our family, our friends, most importantly, our children. Thank you. Judy, well said, as always, and thanks for the reminder and the update on monoclonal antibodies, something we were talking about almost at every press conference a year ago. Uh, it's a good reminder what they do when you, when you are prone or when you should pursue them, et cetera. So thank you for all of that. Pat, we had, as I say, we had some sort of spiked nasty weather. Uh, Monday night, I was on with JCPNL back and forth. Uh, getting a sense of the magnitude of the outages. There were many thousands, as you know. And I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we've got some potentially uh, bad thunderstorms later today, and would love to get an update on where things are with FEMA and any other matters. Welcome. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, with regards to Monday night storms, uh, we did see upwards of 60,000 outages uh, from those. Uh, they came through fast, but they were powerful. Uh, JCP and L did, I think, a great job. I think as of this morning, we were under 1,000 outages. Uh, and I've been in touch with uh, President Fiorliso as well. Uh, and keeping an eye on tonight, I think we and we are expecting severe thunderstorms this afternoon, probably between 5 uh, till about midnight. Uh, we are looking at damaging winds, hail, and I think the greatest impacted area is going to be north of Interstate 78 including uh, Sussex, Warren, Morris, and Western Passaic counties. Um, and we do think that rain tapers off tomorrow. But again, uh, as we've been saying, highlighted by Ida, that paying attention to uh, TV alerts as well as phone alerts is important to keep in, keeping our citizens safe. Uh, with regards to FEMA and that process, uh, our disaster recovery centers have seen several hundred residents come through for assistance, which is good. And as we open them up, that's going to trend in a, in a great direction. Uh, I know they've registered over 37,000 uh, citizens already, 27,000 homeowners and about 10,000 uh, renters. Uh, and as of this morning, have doled out almost $9 million in individual assistance, which is, uh, I think, a pretty phenomenal number. Uh, with the averages being around $4,200 per household. So um, FEMA, again, phenomenal partner, constant communication. Um, and we just continue to, to move forward in that partnership to make sure we get back on our feet as soon as possible. I would like to just make one clarification. There seemed to be some confusion when I talked about line of duty deaths from COVID on Monday. That was a national number when I said 22 of 23. Um, there were some outlets that thought that was 22 law enforcement officers in New Jersey alone. That was not the case. That was a national uh, statistic, set, statistic that I was giving out. And I just wanted to clarify that uh, today, Governor. That's all I have. Pat, thank you. Um, and God rest their souls. I, I read that as national uh, when you said it, but it's good to clarify to make sure folks understand that that's a national reality. Um, and I believe you said 22 of the 23 fatalities were related to COVID. That's correct. Yeah, which is heartbreaking. Um, Pat, the website, we don't have it up uh, on the screen unless Dan can find it for me. Is it disasterassistance.gov, am I correct? I think that is correct, uh, Gov. I should have that in my head, but disasterassistance.gov yeah. uh, will get them to register uh, on that FEMA website. You bet. And that's the place to go, and it's encouraging. We've got folks, we've heard 27,000 homeowners and 10,000 renters have already signed up. So we encourage okay. folks to get in there. The faster you get your, your claim in, the faster you'll get, uh, you'll get it addressed by FEMA. 
Um, thank you for that. And again, thanks to Judy. So, Michelle, uh, why don't we stay for a few questions, if that's okay? And Michelle can uh, be our uh, MC, if that's okay with you. We are good. We're going to start with Joey Fox. Okay, Joey. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Okay, I got a little trio here. Um, so first, have you ruled out calling the legislature back into session uh, for any reason before the upcoming election, um, including, not limited to obviously, but including for the Reproductive Freedom Act? Um, when you had a meal with a uh, new incoming, or now Governor Hochul of New York, did you discuss congestion pricing at all? Was that an issue that came up? And then finally, I know that um, Morris County was the most recent county to have a major disaster declaration issued, but Monmouth, Burlington, and Warren counties were also assessed for the potential of a disaster declaration. Um, does the fact that they haven't had one declared yet and it's been a few days mean that they likely won't be getting one? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good to hear your voice. Uh, I, I, I have not uh, thought uh, about the question of, of the legislature coming back in or, or not. I mean, you have to leave all options on the table. Given the, the world we're in right now, with a pandemic, with Mother Nature, with you name it, um, we, we discussed a number of topics at lunch, uh, and it was a very good lunch uh, outdoors uh, in New York City after the 9-11 memorial in the morning. Uh, I would just leave, as a general matter, a lot of uh, Topics that came up included, other than getting to know each other, uh, obviously, with our spouses, things uh, that, that, that pertain to our bi-state relationship, as you can imagine, federal funding for infrastructure, uh, gateway, port authority matter, matters uh, that generally were on the list. Uh, it's a good question on the other counties. Pat, are they still assessing or have they concluded their assessment on those counties? They are still assessing, Governor, and that... Uh, the fact that they have not been declared yet does not mean that they're not. It's just sometimes in order to do a, the comprehensive assessments to ensure that they hit those thresholds. So at this point, too early to tell, but those damage assessments are ongoing for those counties. The 11 counties that have been named, and this is for the major disaster declaration. And that, that the important point about that is individuals, as Pat pointed out a few minutes ago, not just governmental entities, but individuals are el eligible for money. That is an unprecedented uh, amount of counties in our state. So um, we will keep folks posted if there's any development uh, beyond that. Thank you for that, Michelle. All right, we'll go to Matt Arco. Hey, Matt. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, Governor, do you have any information yet on how many schools, if any, had to shut down and switch to remote learning due to COVID cases since the start of the school year? And, uh, and real quick off topic, in New Jersey, home improvement contractors don't have to prove they have experience, talent, or are fiscally sound to get an HIC registration. Other states, meanwhile, have licenses with more stringent requirements. Uh, would you support a license for this profession, especially given uh, the damage we saw with Ida and the fact that so many people in the state will have to hire contractors to rebuild? Thank you, Matt. Uh, I've never been asked that question before, so I'm going to defer. As a general matter, New Jersey has a high bar. It's rare that we've got a lower bar in terms of qualifications required to get a license uh, in our state. It is We are typically either the the leader of the pack or among the leaders of the pack. Uh, so if this is the case, and I assume it is based on your question, uh, that would be an exception. So but let, let, let us get back to you on that. And if, if Dan and Paramount could help me follow up with Matt. And we do have information on uh, schools that are out. I'll turn it to Judy. And remember, schools in most cases uh, have, have been in session, back in session for a limited amount of time. I think Tina would support me on this so that we don't know the full story yet of how school reopening is going. We will obviously uh, give you that data as we get it. I think, Judy, you're going to start posting this afternoon on your website the status of any outbreaks in schools. But with that, let me turn it over to you. Um, thank you, Governor. Um, we will be posting later on. We're refining the data at this point in time. Uh, it looks like we have six uh, outbreaks um, in um, schools, in, uh, one in Atlantic, uh, two in Atlantic County, one in Cumberland, one in Monmouth, one in Morris, and one in Union. 
Uh, it's a combination of both some staff cases and student cases. And I, I have to remind you that to qualify as an outbreak in a school, it is uh, two cases that are epidemiologically or two or three cases. I know Dr. Tan will, will correct me, three cases that are epidemiologically uh, connected uh, uh, and are not from the same household or have uh, otherwise another connection. Uh, so that uh, information will re be refined. Um, I believe Dr. Tan is planning on uh, posting that uh, sometime later on today. Um, I'm pretty sure that's where we are with that. But we Thanks. do have six outbreaks. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Tina, anything you want to add to that? Um, other than that, um, you know, we are very grateful for our local health departments and supporting um, school districts in terms of um, investigating outbreaks. You know, really the key to um, containment is um, early identification. And, you know, I just want to take the opportunity to remind parents that, you know, if your kids are sick, send them to school. Um, and it's really important that, um, you know, they stop at the door of the schools to try to minimize uh, spread in the community. That's always good advice, pandemic or otherwise. Uh, Dan Bryan confirms, Pat, that it is in fact disasterassistance.gov. That's the website folks should go to to file their individual claims. Uh, Michelle, back to you. Great, next up is David Mathau. Hello, Dave. Dave, you there? Dave, you're on the air, looks to me, there you go. Hi, can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, great. So, Governor, um, just curious about why we're plugging mental health now. Obviously, it's always a good idea, especially in an ongoing uh, stressful situation and like the pandemic. But um, I was also wondering, um, you know, how you're doing with your mental health, um, what you do to try to stay positive, and maybe, you know, what you'd suggest to New Jersey residents who may feel a little funny, maybe they're a little embarrassed about uh, asking for assistance or talking to somebody, you know, what would you recommend that they keep in mind? And for Commissioner Persichilli, um, with regard to monoclonal antibody uh, therapy, what do we know about this therapy and um, the Delta variant? Uh, early on, I know that there was some question about it. Do we think that uh, monoclonal antibody therapy is a good uh, step for people to take again um, in the early stages of illness, even if it's uh, with the Delta variant. And um, can you remind us, you know, how early are we talking about? Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I'm, I'm holding up just fine. I mean, it's obviously for all of us, it's been a, a crazy 19 months. And I've said this many times every time you think you've got this thing figured out, it takes a turn. And eight out of 10 of those turns are for the negative. So I'm, I'm doing fine. I try to exercise, eat right, read a little bit every day uh, of a book, uh, watch a ball game when I can, the stuff that I, I, I enjoy doing. I think more broadly, I think folks should take those numbers to heart that we put up earlier. Uh, and I'll review them again before, uh, as, Judy, as Judy addresses the monoclonal antibodies. No particular reason now, but when more time is on the clock and you think you've got this thing beat and it's, oh my God, here we go again. I got to put the mask back on or whatever it might be. It, it gets people. It, 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 who, could, who could blame them? Uh, and particularly for folks who may be vulnerable to begin with, uh, it has an outsized impact on them. So there's no particular timing on why this particular day of uh, September 15th is the day we raise it, but it's something we, we want to raise regularly. Judy, can you hit the uh, Dave's good question about monoclonal antibodies in particular on how they work up against the variant? And I think the answer is they work, but uh, over to you. Yeah, the, uh, the recent experiences in Florida have proven that they are effective uh, against uh, the Delta variant. Um, you know, as you know, Florida had up, upwards to 15,000 to 20,000 cases in the hospital. Uh, and um, uh, they've, their use of monoclonal antibodies uh, increased exponentially, uh, so much to the point that there is a, d a demand uh, for monoclonal antibodies. The supply is getting limited. So uh, previously, as uh, the uh, supply was managed through uh, the local departments of health, uh, the local state departments of health, 
uh, and then it went direct to uh, the um, providers. It is going to revert back to the Department of Health so that equitable distribution of monoclonal antibodies uh, can be managed going forward. So effective and uh, very important that we make sure that it's equitably distributed uh, in the state. I'll never figure out why certain things have become politicized and other things haven't been. But for all the noise around vaccines and masking, monoclonal antibodies have been universally embraced by leadership around the country. Uh, and that's a, a silver lining to all the challenges I think we, that we're seeing. The, the, the number, Dave, you, you, you give me reason to repeat it for everybody, 862-202-HELP. 862-202-HELP or text NJ-HOPE to 51684. NJ-HOPE to 516. Thank you for that. Michelle, back to you. Okay, and we will go to Daniel Munoz. Hello, Daniel. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing good, Governor. Um, you had been asked, so you've been asked this Monday, but I'm still curious on your answer. Is it is it safe to attend crowded concerts and sporting events uh, like uh, at MetLife or Rutgers football, uh, maskless, maskless, even if they're outdoors and even if you're vaccinated, um, with the the EDA, the Economic Development Authority's Ida relief, is the ten million going to be enough? Um, is are there going to have to be further rounds like there were with the four rounds of COVID relief? And if so, would that be paid for by the state? Or would that the federal government have to kick in at this point? Um, I think it was you who had mentioned the disaster assistance for homeowners and renters. Do you have the numbers? on how much in FEMA or SBA aid has gone uh, for Ida to New Jersey businesses. Um, with the lapse in federal unemployment benefits, are you expecting economic activity and spending and sales tax to taper off? Or do you think it's going to quote, get people back to work? Uh, and lastly, going back to Ida, um, looking back, what would you have dif done differently about the storm uh, and your response to it? Thanks. Uh Listen, Judy and Tina will correct me if I'm wrong. If you're packed in, even if you're outside and you're watching a ball game or a concert, you're probably taking on some additional risk as opposed to if you were sitting on your couch watching the thing on television. There's kind of no other way to get around that. If you're inside, especially if you're near other people whose vaccination status you don't know while you're walking to your seat, put your mask on. Um, we do know the virus is a lot less lethal outside. We also know the metal, speaking of mental health, the, the joy to see a packed met life uh, at the Giants game on Sunday, there's, there's a, we, 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 we have to factor that in as well. But we think what we have in place um, is the, are the right protocols. And obviously these are things that we continue to look at constantly. Is it possible the EDA would pour more, more money on the street for small businesses that were impacted by Ida or Henri. I, I don't want to speak for Tim Sullivan and his team, but the answer has got to be probably yes. However, the major disaster declaration unleashes not only individual assistance, but small business administration and other buckets of money. So I would bet, and I give Tim and his team an enormous amount of credit here for sort of putting that money on the table before we do about the major disaster declaration uh, as, a, as a sort of bridge. Um, and so that's an important point I want to make. I think you asked, do we know the amount of money? Uh, a similar question to individuals, 27,000 homeowners, 10,000 renters. Uh, do we know either the amount of money or amount of businesses that are, are, are being addressed by either the EDA or the SBA? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Pat may, but if we don't, Daniel will follow up with you. Pat, do you happen to have that? I know. And that SBA process is just a little, it's not as immediate. So I can, we did get briefed by the lead from the SBA on the delegation call the other day. So that's an ongoing process. But as, as I get that, I could certainly push that uh, through your office, Gov, to Daniel. Yeah. And on unemployment benefits, which ended the supplemental $300, which ended on September 4th. So that's 11 days ago. Do we, you know, what do we expect to see out of that? Um, I, Listen, I hope it, it, it helps address the labor market uh, challenges that we've had. I personally think it will have 
perhaps a modest impact on that. I don't think it was a big driver to begin with. Uh, I think it probably was a factor. Uh, we will see. We'll know in time. I think more likely it was cash in people's pocket that they now no longer have, but that, but that they desperately needed. So my guess is just you, we may see an impact in economic activity. Um, our economy is still growing at a very high rate. The country's economy is still growing at a very high rate. I, I spoke with the CEO of a big financial services firm today. Um, you know, when you hear that research economists have lowered their outlook to a GDP growth of 5.5% annually, you'd take 5.5% any time of the any any time you could get it, it just happens to be lower than seven or seven and a half percent. So I think that'll be one of the factors. Uh, less people. Um, sorry, this is um, just to prove that we save every penny we can in New Jersey. I'm in a room, but if I don't get up and walk around, the lights go out. So forgive me for a second. Um, there we go. I'm now back. That's yet another proof point that we're not profitably profitably spending. Uh, money on things. Um, listen, for our response, Daniel, I've been asked this a number of times, and, and, and I'll give you plus or minus what you've heard me say before. Just a review in terms of IDA, we uh, organized a call for all of our county OEM folks with the National Weather Service, I think at 10 o'clock that morning. We activated uh, the State Emergency Operations Center, I think a couple of hours later, as I recall, at noon. We communicated with the public throughout the day, including at our press conference during, uh, in other words, during the briefing that we had that we're having today, then in the afternoon into the evening. And obviously, as a general matter, not specific to Ida, after every one of these storms, we look for ways to improve and strengthen our capabilities. And we'll do it in this case as we do it in every case. So that's what I would say to that. Thank you for the questions. And uh, Michelle, back to you. Let's do a couple more if we could. Michelle, you there? Yes, Ken Burns. Ken? Good afternoon, Governor. Hey, Ken, how are you, man? I'm well, um, and it looks like for once I'll be uh, much later than our colleague, Mr. Mathow. Um, serious question about monoclonal antibodies, and you had mentioned that you had mentioned you had talked about it early on in the pandemic. Uh, I know the commissioner has mentioned Florida as uh, where the Delta variant uh, the treatment was successful, but look, but practically, what does that look like in New Jersey? Where can people get this treatment? And does the uh, state have, I know Florida had like clinics, they set up on their own to have the monoclonal antibody clinics. Is the state looking to do similar at some point? Is that it? That's it. Thanks, Ken. Judy, do you mind tackling that? And then Tina can fill in any, any uh, color. Yeah, at this point, uh, we uh, expect that the monoclonal antibodies will be administered at our hospitals. Uh, we are not planning on putting up any clinics for monoclonal antibodies. And again, Judy, the place to go is, is your, your medical, uh, your, your, whoever is covering you as your medical professional or a hospital. Yeah, well, go to your healthcare provider. Uh, in most cases, your healthcare provider will uh, connect you with the hospital for your monoclonal antibodies. Got it. Uh, Pat tells me, uh, thank you, Pat, 161 small business association and SBA applications have been received so far. No loans approved as of today. And maybe over time, not necessarily at every one of our gatherings, but maybe, Pat, we can update folks on some cadence, on both individual assistants and uh, in businesses. Thank you for that. Thank you for Ken. Um, let's do a couple more if we could. Uh, back to you, Michelle. Sure. Next, we'll go to Nikita. Nikita, I miss you. How are you? I'm doing well, Governor. Yourself? I'm well. I, I should say I miss you. And so that is until I hear what your question is, and then I'll, I'll reassess that judgment depending on what it is. Sure. So I've got three for you today. Uh, how does the state plan to repay the $185 million uh, federal unemployment compensation loan it took? Where will that money come from? And what is the expected cost of the loan in the long run? Uh, 
Next, new vaccinations in the first two weeks of September are about 40 points lower than they were in the same period in August. Are you ascribing that drop to Ida and Labor Day? And how big of a concern is that decrease? And lastly, in your view, does the state need additional incentive programs to bolster the ranks of teachers in high demand subject areas like math, science, and ESL? Good questions. Uh, Paramel, I don't have a, a, a crisp answer for the 185 uh, million. If you do not, we'll get back to you, Nikita. But Paramel, do you want to add? No, we'll circle back with Nikita. Okay, thank you for that. I think, among other things, and Judy and Tina could correct me, we had some data issues on the vaccination numbers. I, I was looking at day to day last week, uh, even earlier to this week, three to four thousand, then all of a sudden a big jump. So I think part of this may be data, but I'll defer to Judy. I do think it's a combination of storm, back to school, holiday weekend. Uh, but we're grinding away. We're still knocking on doors and we're still doing everything we can to, to get it. And I, I'd say, lastly, open-minded. You, you have to be. We are, um, we are the state of innovation. Uh, that is our forte. That's not to say that we're not good. You know, when I say STEM, uh, the the uh, humanitarian uh, scholars out there, the artists, will want me to say STEAM. And I, and I, and and we do have an extraordinary social science, humanities, arts, and letters reputation as well. But in the cold-blooded economic development sense, it's the innovation space, science, tech, engineering, math. And if we need to be creative to, to funnel a, a stronger pipeline into those fields or other fields, uh, color me absolutely open-minded to work uh, on that. Uh, that. That would obviously be my guesses with the big teachers unions and institutions of higher education. Uh, Judy or Tina, anything you want to add on the on the, the flagging uh, vaccination numbers that we've seen in early September? Yeah, I think that it's a combination of all of the um, factors that you uh, enumerated, uh, Governor. Uh, some data um, lags, um, which, by the way, we catch up every day. Uh, when you think of over 1,500 outlets uh, in New Jersey to uh, provide vaccinations, you you know, managing all of the inputs from that. Uh, sometimes there's some lag, but we had a holiday, we had bad weather, uh, all of that affects, and vacations, all of that affects uh, vaccination uptake. Amen. Thank you for that. Thanks, Nikita. Michelle, let's do one more, if that's all right. Yes. Last one will be Alex Zidane. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Can you hear me? I wanted to ask you first, forgive me if, if Daniel already asked this because I didn't hear his questions. Are you going to allow the DEP to conduct an emergency bear hunt? Uh, the reason for this apparently is because the bear population in New Jersey has doubled in the past three years. Doesn't that once and for all show that we do need a bear hunt in this state? For the commissioner, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Is it two or three students that are not from the same home with COVID that constitute an in-school outbreak? And it's, is there currently? It's, it's three, Alex. Three. Yep. Is that a change from last year? I, I believe it was two last year. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that? A, are you changing the standards and how you're counting these? And is there? And are there any reports of in-school transmission of COVID right now? For the colonel, I know that you were talking about national numbers yesterday. Do you have state numbers on how many members of law enforcement in New Jersey have died due to COVID-19? And finally, for the governor, just in general on the campaign. How do you assess where you are six, seven weeks out? How much time do you anticipate spending campaigning down the stretch? And do you believe the Club for Growth poll that shows you and Jack Cittarelli neck and neck or the polls from earlier this summer that show you with a double digit lead? Or are you really going to campaign like you're 10 points behind? Because it looks like either way, you're not. Uh, several things. There will be no bear hunt this year, period. I can say that definitively. Uh, and we will, and, and I know Sean LaTourette and his team are committed to this. We put money in the budget, in fact, to support this. We are committed to non-lethal, humane, uh, but smart and safe means to control the population, the bear population. Uh, I will let Tina and Judy answer the question on uh, the number of kids that are, or persons, I should say, because it's also educators and staff that constitute an outbreak this year versus last. 
Uh, and I think you may have missed that earlier on, Alex. There are six outbreaks uh, in the state impacting 20 persons, mix of students and staff. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm in the category, I'd rather stay away from politics on this, obviously. Uh, I'm in the middle of running for re-election. I don't spend a whole lot of time and never have looking at polls. Uh, and the overwhelming amount of my time, although I do spend time campaigning, the overwhelming amount of my time, uh, which I think folks would want me to, to be doing, is focused on, on governing the state. When you've got the challenges that we have, particularly in a pandemic and the recovery from it and other nature and, and other issues thrown our way, my, my overwhelming focus is on governing the state and it will continue to be. Um, Pat, any com any uh, I know we've memorialized members of law enforcement. Any idea of the numbers that we've lost to COVID? I, I can get that to you, Alex. I, I, we were keeping a running tally on not only uh, obviously positive tests, uh, but as well as uh, law enforcement deaths. So I could probably have that to you by this afternoon. Thank you, Pat. And then uh, Judy and Tina, any comment on the three person? Uh, parameter for an outbreak in one of our schools. Yeah, um, this presented a change from last year's uh, definition of this in-person, in-school uh, outbreak. Uh, we did that, uh, we increased to three cases um, because we wanted to align with CDC's changes in their uh, definitions of the school, in-school um, outbreak. And um, the, the numbers that the commissioner had mentioned earlier, the um, six um, outbreaks, these did represent um, uh, in-school transmission outbreaks. A good clarification. So thank you for that. Um, that's all for today. Again, to our Jewish brothers and sisters, Gamar Hatima Tova. Uh, we wish you a, a, an easy and meaningful fast for Yom Kippur. On behalf of Judy and Tina and Pat and the rest of our team, uh, we thank you for joining us virtually. Uh, we will be together, unless you hear otherwise, uh, a couple of times again next week. I think we'll stick at least till we get a little bit more through this Delta surge and a little bit better handle on what back to school is looking like. We'll probably stay with the two a week uh, cadence for at least the next few weeks. So assume that we'll be Monday and Wednesday at one o'clock. And that will include, unless, again, you hear otherwise, in person in both cases. Thank you all. God bless.